Well, the title of the talk is Wolfenite, the official state mineral of Arizona. Uh, I'm not sure how many states have official minerals, uh, you know, designated by proclamation, but recently we, we got Wolfenite as ours. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that came to be, and then we're going to look at some of the um, the top Arizona localities that have produced collectible wolfenite specimens and uh, quite a bit of eye candy, which is always fun. So, um, so most states have official things, right? Official state flowers, official state trees, official state you know, you, so on and so forth. Here's a list of Arizona's official objects. So our official state bird is the cactus wren. The official flower is the saguaro cactus. The official fish is the Apache trout, uh, so on and so, so forth. We even have official neckwear, which is the bola tie. Generally, these bola ties are fitted with uh, uh, cabochons of turquoise or some other gemstone. Uh, but down here at the bottom, we, we get into some of the more interesting stuff. The, the official state gemstone of Arizona is turquoise, naturally, since we have probably more fine, high quality turquoise deposits uh, than anywhere else in the United States. Our official state fossil is petrified wood. We boast the Petrified Forest National Park. Uh, Arizona is also the copper state, so our official state metal is copper, but we had no state mineral. So this was seen as a great injustice by some of us here. And so those of us who were pushing for this, you know, we were thinking, well, what mineral should it be? What what should be our state mineral? Should it be a copper mineral like azurite? Should it be vanadinite? Should it be uh, malachite? Should it be, well, wolfenite is, is really cool. Wolfenite is beautiful. Everyone loves it. So here's some of the, the, the reasons we uh, decided to start pushing for, for wolfenite. Um, Arizona has more world-class wolfenite localities than any spot on earth. Um, as a geographical area. No other state in the United States has more known wolfenite occurrences. Uh, we're at over 200 localities that have produced wolfenite and counting. Now the vast majority of these are small crystals, micros, what, what have you, but that's a lot of locations. And of course, wolfenite is very collectible. It's very beautiful. Everybody loves it. So wolfenite seemed to be a natural choice. Here's a, an example from the Rowley mine uh, in Alex Schaus's collection. So in addition, wolfenite from Arizona has been featured on, in all kinds of media. Everywhere you look for years and years and years, uh, wolfenite from Arizona shows up. So here are some show posters uh, that I've found with Wolfenites from Arizona, Houston, 2016, Tucson, uh, let's see, that was 2018. Of course, I've been on the cover of lots of books, mineralogical record supplement there, the mineral collections in Arizona. Magazine covers, here's Rock and Gem. Here's a red cloud wolfenite on the cover of Mineralogical Records from the 1990s. Mineral dealer advertisements, such as my own advertisements, seen here. Mineral calendars, it shows up. This is the one put out by Gloria Stabler and Lithography, the 2017 wolfenite calendar, very well done. So it's just really photogenic. Everyone loves it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is wolfenite. I'm sure most of you know all this stuff, but let's refresh our memories a little bit. Um, wolfenite, its chemical composition is lead molybdate. So 
It's composed of lead, molybdenum, and oxygen. It crystallizes in the tetragonal crystal system. Other minerals that you're familiar with that, that are tetragonal would be sulfur, anatase, and zircon, plus many others. It's quite soft, 2.5 to 3.0 in hardness. Uh, the color is what really stands out. It, it's typically orange, yellow, it can be uh, red, it can be brown, it could even be kind of bluish. Uh, however, pure lead molybdate is actually colorless. And I think the Sumeb mine is one of the places that's produced some near colorless wolfenite. That's actually pretty rare. So uh, now wolfenite is a member of the shelite group. And the shelite group forms this series uh, with one end member is stolzite, which is the lead tungstate, and wolfenite is the molybdenum end member of the series, with tungsten, you know, here substituting for molybdenum and vice versa. So, uh, but it's got a crystal structure and uh, unit cell very similar to, to that of shelite, uh, which also crystallizes in the tetragonal system. So where does it form? It forms in oxidized uh, or weathered deposits uh, of hydrothermal lead. Uh, and, uh, you know, these, these veins of typically galena will weather and oxidize. And if there's a little bit of molybdenum present, maybe in the form of molybdenite or some other molybdenum mineral, you can get wolfenite forming. So uh, typically these, these deep oxidized and weathered zones are found in, in desert or arid areas. Uh, now wolfenite was named after Franz Javier von Wolfen and, uh, in 1845. Now he was a Jesuit priest and a mineralogist who wrote the first monograph on lead ores, uh, including wolfenite uh, from Bleiberg, Austria, which is the type locality for wolfenite. So here are some drawings of the idealized tetragonal crystal form. So you would expect wolfenite to look like this. So looking at the crystal basically from the side along the A or B axis, it's going to look like this. It's two, two uh, it, pyramids. So it's bipyramidal, two pyramids back to back. Um, looking from the top or down the C axis, it's going to look like this. Um, you know, so it's like anatase or sulfur or shelite. But uh, what happens with wolfenite is most of the time it likes to do this. So it, it, it tends to form in these uh, kind of squashed tetragonal forms where the C axis is is uh, uh, very, it's not very tall. It's kind of squished in that direction. So here we are looking on edge at the A or B axis of the crystal. And here it is looking down the top of the crystal, down the C axis. So you get this huge, this huge pinacoid here, face where the, uh, you know, down the C axis. Now, of course, you do see wolfenites that look like this. They're kind of rare, but there's a couple locations that produce them like this. The Ojuela mine um, is one down in Mexico, and Los Lamentos in Mexico also produces this crystal habit. So here's what you end up with. Most wolfenites look like this. These beautiful bladed tabular crystals um, with this face here being actually the, the top of the C axis. So here are some crystals from the Red Cloud Mine that were collected in 2015. Nice little group of crystals. Okay, so who were the guys that really got wolfenite to be uh, declared the official state mineral of Arizona? Really, it was these two guys. They're, they were instrumental in getting this done. Um, the guy on the left, you probably know, some of you may know, Dr. Alex Schaus. He's a well-known collector. Uh, he's been collecting for decades and lives near Tucson. 
that's his uh, <laughs> his perky box. He loves thumbnails. He's a thumbnail collector. That's his perky box plate that uh, he, <laughs> funny story, he applied to get this this uh, specialized plate from the state of Arizona and they denied him for many months because they claimed that uh, Perky Box was uh, obscene. So, <laughs> so he had to, to uh, write back with a whole lot of uh, data and articles and descriptions and different things, uh, you know, telling them that no, this Perky Box thing is actually a uh, it's something that we mineral collectors use to put our minerals in, and it's very, it's perfectly benign, and there's nothing wrong with it. So they finally granted him the, the plate. But uh, anyway, the other guy that uh, was uh, instrumental here was the president of the Mineralogical Society of Arizona. That's Chris Whitney Smith. And these were the two guys that really pushed for this legislation. So we'll do a quick timeline here. Uh, this all started in 2013. Alex realized, you know, hey, we don't have a state mineral. So uh, he talked to a bunch of us collectors here and we all thought, yeah, let's let's do wolfenite. So uh, two years, but he didn't really do anything about it. Two years later, um, we got an official state medal and that got Alex thinking, hey, we really need to do this. So. The next year, he talked to his local representative, this Mark Fincham down in Tucson, and he agreed to be the sponsor of this legislation. So the first year they introduced it, it died in committee. They didn't want to hear it. So a, a whole year later, Representative Fincham reintroduced the bill. And by this time, we'd uh, circulated a whole bunch of petitions and gotten a bunch of signatures. So it actually passed committee in January of uh, 2017. So now keep in mind, now it's it's Tucson time. So all this is happening during the Tucson show 2017. So these guys are running around gathering signatures. They're running back and forth between Tucson and Phoenix, you know, up to the state capitol, pushing this thing uh, while this legislation is going through committee. So uh, by February 7th, Chris had brought a whole bunch of young rock hounds from the MSA up to the Capitol with their parents to show the, the House of Representatives that there's really support for this bill. Uh, they passed out copies of the Wolfenite calendar, so that way these guys would know, you know what Wolfenite is. And two days later, the House passed it, 57 to 1. I don't know who the one is, but uh, we wanted to go by and egg their house, but we decided not to do that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, continuing on, uh, the bill went to the Senate and uh, the governor and Representative Fincham had reps come down to the Tucson show. We had put in a case of Wolfenite so they could, uh, you know, promoting this, this legislation. Uh, we got on TV. So uh, by, you know, then Tucson, you know, the show ended. But by the middle of March, the bill passed the Senate. Woohoo! And it went to the governor for signature, and Governor Ducey signed the bill. And by March 22nd of that year, the bill passed. Arizona had Wolfenite as its official state mineral. So here's some of the stuff that they did to promote this. This is uh, a handout that Alex and Chris made promoting this. Here are pictures of Mineralogical Society members at the state capitol with calendars and posters handing these things out to state representatives. Here's the Wolfenite display at the 2017 PGMS show that these guys put together. Uh, I put some pieces in here from my collection and uh, we got most of the Arizona collectors to uh, to put something in the exhibit. Um, and here's the moment that the bill passed in the Senate, memorialized by Chris Whitney Smith, 
Victory at last. All right. So now let's talk about some of the world-class wolfenite producing localities in the state of Arizona. What I've done here is I've arranged them by county. So uh, we've got quite a few, as you can see, and I'm sure you've heard of most of these. Some you may not have heard of, but we're going to look at photographs of specimens, and I've got site uh, photos for you all to take a look at. So starting with Cochise County, we've got the Hilltop Mine, Defiance Mine, Silverbill, and the Tombstone District. Gila County has the 79 Mine and a couple of others. Um, Red Cloud Mine, you've all heard of in La Paz County. Rowley Mine in Maricopa. Rawhide Mine, which you've probably not heard of. Down near Tucson, we've got the old Yuma Mine. Canal County, we've got Tiger, Glove Mine, and a couple others down here in some other counties. So let's let's get right into it. Here's a map of all these localities. And one thing you're going to notice is that they're all concentrated in the, set, the southern half of the state. And that's because the, the top half of the state, you know, the, the northern half, is basically covered with thick layers of Mesozoic sedimentary rocks. And there's not a lot of good exposure there of ore deposits. So there's really nothing up there in the way of uh, secondary lead or copper minerals. The southern half of the state is in what's called the Basin and Range Geological Province, which is a series of mountains and valleys uh, formed by uh, basically um, tension or pulling or separation of the crust so that you have down dropped uh, fault blocks dropping into valleys and mountain ranges rising. And this happened over about 15 million years. So you've got uh, many millions of years of erosion, oxidation, and uh, uh, weathering and exposure of these ore deposits. So you've got all these beautiful uh, hydrothermal deposits and porphyry copper deposits exposed on the surface, which you know render them quite mineable and quite you know discoverable. Uh, now the Basin and Range Province also continues right up through California and on into Nevada and Utah. It's very distinctive on the map. All right, let's just jump right into these localities. Um, the Defiance Mine is a pretty well-known mine for wolfenite specimens. You've seen these in many collections, I'm sure. Uh, this is a picture of what's called Gleason Ridge. This is in the southeast corner of the state. So if we go back, it's down here. Um, so this is the dump here on the left for the Defiance Mine. Now, the specimens that I'm sure you've seen in people's collections are the ones that look like this. Whoops. This one uh, is actually in my collection. It's an eight centimeter piece. These specimens with these real distinctive coxcomb formed uh, wolfenite crystals all came out of a pocket hit in 1957. It was a huge pocket collected by a uh, famous mineralogist, Dick Bedeau, and it produced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of specimens. So the examples of these are still seen on the market today. And uh, it's easily the most famous wolfenite discovery at the Defiance Mine. Here's another one that's in Les Presmes collection, uh, showing this distinctive uh, peaked coxcomb habit. Here's another one in my collection. That one's 11 centimeters across. Now, right next door is what's known as the Silver Bill Mine. You can see the similarity to the last picture. So you've got the Defiance here right next to the Silver Bill. They're basically working some of the same ore bodies. 
And the silver bill mine has also produced some very nice wolfenite specimens. They look somewhat different. So here's a piece from the silver bill mine. Typically, it, it produces these yellowish kind of opaque crystals um, with satiny luster. Here's a nice cabinet size piece, small cabinet from Ian Whitlock's collection, six centimeters across from the silver bill mine. The silver bill also produces uh, a variety of secondary zinc and copper minerals. So here's a wolfenite crystal on hemimorphite from the 79 mine with a little bit of calcite. So pretty cool combinations you can find here. Moving to the south eastern corner of Cochise County is the Hilltop Mine up in the Chiricahua Mountains. Now the Hilltop Mine was quite active in the first half of the 20th century. And at that time, it produced a lot of fine wolfenite specimens that were uh, on the market. You've probably seen these and they look like this. They're beautiful yellow tabular crystals on snow white calcite. Now, the vast majority of these were collected in the 1930s by a fellow named Ed Over. And Ed Over was a very uh, legendary field collector in the first half of the 20th century, made many remarkable discoveries at the Red Cloud Mine and uh, Verisite in Fairfield, Utah, and many, many other places. So he made several major discoveries here at the Hilltop Mine. And these specimens were marketed in the 1930s and the 1940s by a dealer in Massachusetts named Shortman's Minerals. So here's a typical piece from some of these pockets in Mark Hayes' collection. Here's another one in Mark Hayes' collection. He's a local collector of Arizona minerals here in Phoenix. This one's about 12 centimeters tall. And really, these are the finest yellow wolfenites, I think, found in the world, uh, at least until the similar material was discovered at the Tuisit mine in Morocco back in the 1980s. Here's a close up. This is a piece from uh, Arkenstone of these beautiful lemon yellow crystals on the white calcite. Very distinctive and very, very typical of these early discoveries at the Hilltop Mine. Another piece that, uh, that I got from, uh, I think I got from Rob's website, Arkenstone specimen, about six centimeters across. Also in Cochise County is the very famous silver district of Tombstone. And I'm sure you've all heard of this. The tomb, heyday of Tombstone was the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, but it also produced a fair number of other minerals, uh, lead minerals, tellurium minerals, a lot of interesting rarities, and uh, including uh, wolfenite. So the Tufnut Mine, which is also called the Empire Mine. Well, it's two mines actually that kind of connect on the ground. So they're basically the same mine. But this is the, the mine site right here. You don't see much of it, but there's a, actually a shaft here that's open. So the wolfenites from Tombstone um, vary in color. Some of them are kind of amber colored like this, and, but others are quite yellow orange. Here's one in Les Presnick's collection from the Tough Nut Mine. That's three and a half centimeters across. Some of them are associated with nice yellow hemispheres and balls of mimetite. So this is another one um, in a, uh, uh, that's Mark Hayes' collection, seven centimeters across, I think. And this one's five centimeters across. That's in Les Presnick's collection. 
also from Tombstone. So moving to the central part of the state uh, is Gila County. And we go to the 79 mine. The 79 mine has produced a huge variety of secondary lead, copper, and zinc minerals for many, many decades. Uh, fortunately, it's owned by mineral collectors now, and it's still producing specimens to this very day. So there's usually a pretty good supply of 79 mine specimens on the market. So this is, you can see the head frame here, but actually the main entrance to the mine is an adit down here uh, at the base of the dump. Now the finest wolfenite specimens from the 79 mine that were found are typically acknowledged to be these so-called red spot wolfenites. So what these are is, um, this is probably the best one in existence. Very gemmy orange crystals, but they have this very distinctive deep orange red spot in the center, um, you know, which is obviously a type, some sort of zoning effect. So the crystal was orange right at the very beginning. And then uh, whatever was causing the red color kind of dropped out and uh, the rest of it is orange. Very famous find. These were hit in the early 1970s. Similar crystal habit, similar color, but without the red spot. Uh, this specimen's in Les Presmix collection. Beautiful beveled uh, window panes of wolfenite associated with black motramite. These are these are really the, the top of the, the line for 79 mine wolfenites. This one's in John Callahan's collection. He owned the 79 mine for several years and was working it uh, all through the 90s and the early 2000s. This one's three centimeters across and it looks like it's got some little sprays of hydrozincite on it. Now that's a wolfenite window pane right there. That's a 2.5 centimeter on edge crystal from the 79 mine uh, sitting on hemimorphite that uh, George Goat has collected. He's, he's probably collected more wolfenite than any other digger in Arizona. And I believe in the last Arizona issue of the mineralogical record, there was a really nice article about him and all of his major discoveries that he's made. Uh, quite, quite a uh, legend here uh, among Arizona field collectors. Another one from the 79 mine. This specimen was actually purchased by my dad in uh, 1969, and uh, we've had that in our collection ever since. It's also on kind of a sparkly black motramite, but really, really kind of distinctive uh, wolfenite from 79 mine. These very thin, delicate window panes. Another 79 mine piece, probably collected in the early 2000s. Uh, by John Callahan, former mine owner. And I've got a picture of John collecting wolfenite coming up that's really good. Oh yeah, here's a neat one. This is a wolfenite cluster that's actually coated with blue hemimorphite. You get these really great combinations of different minerals at the 79 mine. It's, it's a very, beloved locality among collectors. And this is the finest example that I know of, of this, this particular combination that's in Mark Hay's collection. Ah, uh, there's that picture of John Callahan mining wolfenite. Now this is a completely unretouched photo taken underground. This is not Photoshop. <laughs> and you can see that huge smile on Jan, John Callahan's face. Of course, I'm, I'm pulling your leg a little bit. The, the photo has been tweaked just a little bit, but uh, 
So we're having a little fun here, but so uh, that's that's underground at the 79 mine, probably the 400 level, which is where most of the collecting is done. Now, not too far from the 79 mine is another mine called the Finch Mine, AKA the Barking Spider Mine. So uh, it was under lease for a while in the 1980s and uh, was renamed the Barking Spider Mine. I don't want to talk about exactly what a barking spider is, but some of you probably might, might know. <laughs> now, the Finch Mine pieces are really cool because here you get the same delicate wolfenite blades as you do nearby at the 79 mine, but they're coated with druzy quartz most of the time. So you get these beautiful, sturdy specimens that are very durable. Here's an Arkenstone piece from the Finch mine, druzy quartz coating wolfenite crystals. Now the quartz can coat wolfenite in different thicknesses. Here's a very thin coating of quartz on the wolfenite blades. And uh, the quartz also here has coated hemimorphite. So you get the same kind of mineral assemblage as you do at the 79 mine, only it, it's coated with quartz. In fact, I've seen some of these specimens where the quartz has has coated the wolfenite and there's been a dissolution of the wolfenite to such a degree that there's no longer any wolfenite left. And you get these quartz epimorphs uh, of wolfenite crystals. I don't think I have a photograph of that, but it's pretty cool. Here's another Finch mine piece, orange bladed wolfenite, completely coated by druzy quartz. Really neat stuff. So let's move to the southwest corner of the state, almost into California, right on the Colorado River um, is the Red Cloud Mine. Uh, in my opinion, probably the world's greatest wolfenite locality uh, has produced since the 1880s, wonderful red, crystals of wolfenite. I got a couple photographs of the mine here. This one's in the 1980s. And back then it was strictly an underground mine, uh, you know, with many levels, 300 levels, 200, 300, 400, 500. But then in the, uh, in the 90s, uh, a consortium of, of people led by Wayne Thompson and uh, Gene Myron decided to do an open cut of the vein from the surface to mine specimens. And that was done in the mid 1990s. And they were quite successful doing an open cut. So now you see the, the tailings here from the, the open cut of the, uh, the, uh, the vein, you know, the surface mining. Here's a picture from underground. This is in the south stopes. You can see the dip of the vein here and some really nice, uh, nice timbering here with these stalls. Now, this is pretty much what made the Red Cloud Mine famous. A guy named uh, Arthur Montgomery had seen specimens in museums in the early 20th century back east. I think he'd seen them in the Carnegie American Museum, uh, Yale collection, and he saw these specimens on display of these unbelievable giant red crystals and crystal clusters from this place called the Red Cloud Mine from the 1880s, 1890s. So he had a guy named Ed Over, which I who I talked about earlier, who went out and did specimen mining for him. So Art Montgomery said, hey, Ed, why don't you go out to this red cloud mine and check it out and see what you can find. So Ed somehow befriended the mine owners who were actually working the mine at the time in the 
1930s this was for silver and lead. And somehow he was able to get permission to go underground and, and collect these crystals. Well, he made a hell of a discovery um, and collected what are arguably the world's finest wolfenite specimens and certainly the finest ever found at the Red Cloud Mine. And here's an example of one. This is an Ed Over collected specimen, a uh, single crystal found in 1938, formerly in uh, Dick Badeau's collection and now in Wayne and Donna Light's collection. So this is a, a Rock Courier photo. Some of you are probably familiar with Rock Courier's um, measurement bar here. So this, this left hand side of this brass bar is an inch and the right hand side is a centimeter. So you can see right here that it's, a, it's about a two inch or two inch plus crystal. Very gemmy and absolutely perfect. So these, these red cloud, these Ed Ober crystals are world famous and uh, people have been trying to find stuff like this at the Red Cloud since that time. And none of the discoveries at the Red Cloud have quite come close to these. Um, Bill Larson has another specimen from the Ed Over find. Uh, there are several in museums around the world. They're not easy to get, but uh, certainly amazing things. So here's another piece from the Red Cloud Mine. This is actually a thumbnail. It used to be in my collection. It's now in Kyle Favorkian's collection. And it's a neat combination of wolfenite crystal on red mimetite. And this was found in a very distinctive pocket from the 1980s. Now I mentioned Wayne Thompson and his consortium of guys that were mining the red cloud in the 90s. Well, they had a major discovery in the open pit that they were working back in 1996. And it was actually a, a crack completely lined with wolfenite crystals that went many meters. Um, pretty unprecedented for the mine. You know, the red cloud mine pockets there typically are very small. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe baseball size or grapefruit size, you know, with a few crystals. Well, to find a crystal line cracked, crack that goes many, many meters was, was uh, certainly a one-time find. And it produced hundreds and hundreds of specimens. Many of the pieces you see on the market now came from this, this single find. And what was distinctive about this find is it actually produced crystal clusters. You know, rather than a single crystal on matrix or, you know, a couple crystals on a piece of matrix, you get these, these plates of crystals. So here's one that's in my collection. It's one of the top pieces from the find. It's 12 centimeters across. It's pretty amazing. Here's another one from that discovery. Uh, very distinctive. These crystal plates from uh, April of 1996. This is also from April of 1996. Uh, this one's in Rudolf Watzel's collection over in uh, Austria. This is a more recent find from 2015. Uh, and this was deep in the underground at the Red Cloud Mine. This one's been photographed a lot. Got that really neat kind of butterfly shaped crystal. I mean, it's been, been published a lot, rather. Here's another one from 2015 in uh, Fabian Wildfang's collection. He's a pretty major collector in Germany. And he, he actually runs a really neat Facebook page called Aesthetics in Mineral Collecting, which features only minerals of high aesthetic quality and it's really, really neat. If you haven't checked it out, you, you might want to take a look at that. Another one from 2015. This one's really interesting. 
Uh, it's a uh, crystal's about an inch and a quarter, so it's a good sized crystal, but it's on uh, it's actually on barite. Really unusual for for the red cloud mine. That's white barite there. Matrix at the red cloud is typically a a uh, you know an iron oxide gaussian or it's a quartz or calcite, but barite is a little unusual. Another one from 2015, that distinctive beveled edge from the red cloud. Another piece from the red cloud. This is from near, really, this is actually from right on the surface, collected in 2017. Okay, uh, I pulled up on, uh, I guess this is Mindat. Uh, a Google image of the district there. And uh, the Red Cloud Mine is down here. There's another mine not too far away called the North Geronimo Mine, which has produced a lot of great material, very similar to the Red Cloud Mine. And the reason it's similar is the North, there's a fault that runs through here, that, a, a mineralized fault. It's called the Red Cloud Fault. And it's got pretty heavy lead mineralization. Uh, and it runs from the Red Cloud Mine on the south up to the North Geronimo on the north. There's quite a few mines along here, along the strike of the, the vein. But as you can see, the North Geronimo has produced material that's every bit as good as the Red Cloud. And in fact, in many cases, the color is even a little bit better than Red Cloud. It just hasn't produced quantity that uh, that the red cloud has. Here's one from the North Geronimo mine. Oh, it's also called the pure potential mine. So if you've seen things labeled pure potential mine, either wolfenite or vanadinite, it's, it's the same place. Another wolfenite from North Geronimo. Very similar to the red cloud. Uh, moving a little further east into Maricopa County, which is the same county where Phoenix is located, is the Rowley Mine. Uh, here's a couple photos I took at the Rowley five or six years ago. Uh, this is the main incline to the Rowley. And, uh, the main, you know, that's the the entrance that you go into. This is down on the 125 level. That's me. So it's a really fun place. It produces great material. Now here's what a wolfenite pocket looks in situ. A lot of people haven't had a chance to see something like this, but we were taken underground at the rally by a guy named Keith Wentz, who was working the property back in 2015. He didn't let us collect underground, but he was perfectly happy to show us around. And um, they had just broken into this pocket and he had, had not extracted it yet. So uh, I was able to get a really nice photograph these crystals, I'm going to say, are probably up to two centimeters. So these, these crystals down here are probably one centimeter. And these bigger ones up here are probably pushing two centimeters. So that's, that's, it was pretty cool. It was all I could do to, to not pick up a hammer and <laughs> start collecting. But we had to respect uh, we had to respect Keith. So I'm sure most of you have seen specimens from the Rowley mine. It's produced a lot of material. Collectors have been going there since the early 1960s, and uh, the material is quite distinctive. It's beautiful orange window panes. Here's one uh, that was collected in 2004. Here's one that was collected 
probably around 2007 in uh, Robbie McCarty's collection. The vein is basically composed of barite. So a lot of these uh, wolfenite specimens are going to be on barite. Here's a specimen that, uh, that we had, which is now in a collection somewhere in Texas. And it's a 16 centimeter, basically it's the whole pocket, or at least half the pocket. Um, wolfenite crystals on orange mimetite. The rally has certainly produced great wolfenites, but it's also uh, produced, what, in my opinion, the finest mimetite specimens in Arizona. You can see here uh, the mimetite with wolfenite. And the mimetite takes a lot of different forms. It can be fibrous, it can be uh, uh, you know, small spheres. Uh, sometimes it'll be hexagonal prisms. So a lot of variety to the, the mimetite. Sometimes you get these neat combinations of lead minerals with copper minerals at the rally. Here's wolfenite with chrysocolla. Here's a specimen uh, of wolfenite that I had just purchased from the rally. And uh, that's in my front yard. That specimen's now in the Scott Rudolph collection out in uh, Long Island, New York. Another piece from the Rowley Wolfenite associated with mimetite. Here's a really big one. It's again, nearly an entire pocket of wolfenite extracted very carefully and kept in one piece, uh, 18 centimeters across. This is probably the single best mineral specimen that I've ever collected. I collected that at the Rowley in 2004, a pocket of wolfenite on barite, 15 centimeters across. So uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a, a good day. More wolfenite from the Rowley collected 2004 formerly in Keith Proctor's collection and uh, now in another collection. This is a lesser known mine called the Rawhide Mine. It's in Mojave County, Arizona. Um, and there's a Google image. This is kind of, kind of in West Central Arizona, if you can picture that. It hasn't produced a lot of specimens, but the ones that it has produced are unbelievable. This is, a specimen in Mark Hayes collection collected by Dave Shannon back in the 80s, wolfenite with mimetite, 3.5 centimeters across. Rawhide mine associated with little sprays of quartz. Moving into the southern part of the state, not too far from Tucson was the old Yuma mine. Um, there's a mountain range just west of Tucson called the Tucson Mountains. You can see it very distinctly from the Westward Look Resort. And really from any vantage point in Tucson, if you look west, you can see these mountains. And that's where the old Yuma mine was located. Here are pictures that were taken in the early 1980s of the, uh, the decline and uh, some of the track that they had run down in there and they were working the mine for specimens at that time. The mine has since been closed. Unfortunately, the, the mine site has been subsumed into the Saguaro National Park and has been re fully reclaimed and it's basically a dead locality. Probably the number one specimen in existence from the old Yuma mine is this piece. That is a 10 centimeter tall, uh, pretty much a single crystal, <laughs> 10 centimeters tall uh, that was collected in the early 70s 
in the collection of John Caesar. That pocket was collected by him and uh, Gene Schlepp. Old humus specimens, uh, the wolfenites from there have a very similar crystal habit to the red cloud mine, these fat crystals with beveled edges. But instead of being red, like red cloud, they're orange. So you could kind of nickname them orange clouds if you if you want, because that's really what they, they kind of look like. Another old Yuma wolfenite, probably collected in the 1960s, and that's in my collection. This is something really rare from the old Yuma. There were a couple pockets hit where you got these combinations of six ling twin cerusites, which is a lead carbonate with these window pane wolfenite crystals. And I was lucky enough actually to acquire this piece a couple years ago, so it's in my collection now. Southern part of Pima County, south of Tucson is located uh, the, the total wreck mine. And this is a photograph of it in 1909, and it's produced some pretty good specimens. You can still get into it. It's, the road is very difficult, very rough, but collectors do occasionally get in there and, uh, and find some things. Here's one collected in the early 90s. Looks kind of similar to Wolfenite from the Glove Mine, which we'll talk about a little later. This one's got a nice dusting of calcite crystal. The Total Wreck Mine has also produced material that looks like this. Very jammy, deep orange uh, window panes. Now we couldn't talk about Arizona Wolfenite without talking about Tiger. Certainly, uh, Many collectors' same, favorite mineral specimen localities in the state it's produced many, many different rare lead species and also wolfenite. So here are some pictures that I took on a field trip. We were allowed in to the property uh, by the mine owner, uh, which at that time was BHP Billiton, and uh, for a field trip. And that was with the uh, Mineralogical Society. So the, there's an open cut uh, of the Collins vein at the top of the hill above the underground workings. And you can scratch around in the open cut and still find a few little things. We found micro wolfenites. So it was kind of fun. That's me with Dr. Ray Grant. And this is Mike Shannon digging Bill Yedowitz. He's uh, Part of the member of the club here. So, yeah, it was fun. Of course, the best Wolfenites came out in the old days. This is a piece that was collected in the 1890s from that open cut, but of course, from the rich part of the vein, which was all mined out. And uh, now, if you see specimens from Tiger, Wolfenite specimens that kind of have this smoked appearance and uh, you, you turn this around and it's got kind of a black manganese coating on it that pretty much dates these to the 1890s they're very, really distinctive the wolfenites that came out during later times didn't have that and we'll look at some pictures of those so but these old ones have that kind of smoked orange appearance Here's another one from that time period uh, in the University of Arizona Museum collection. You can see over here that kind of smoky look. And if you would turn it around, you'd see the, the black uh, manganese oxide. And this is on quartz crystals, really neat, distinctive piece. Here's a tiger wolfenite from later, a later period, probably from the 1940s. And these came from the underground work. The underground produced these very distinctive orange blades. This is typically what you'd see from tiger. 
clusters of deep orange blades uh, without that black manganese coating. Now the underground closed in 1953. So basically everything on the market you see from Tiger dates to pre-1953. Another specimen from Tiger on kind of a lightweight clay matrix. Tiger also produced these awesome combos of wolfenite with other minerals, uh, in particular dioptase, which is uh, copper silicate. Sometimes you get three minerals in one, and uh, wolfenite, dioptase, and cerusite. So this is probably the most sought after combo from Tiger. Here's another example of one of those wolfenite with dioptase, with cerusite, and also with little black fornicite crystals. So that's a four species combo. Now here's a Google Earth shot that I got off the internet. Uh, Tiger's right here. And there's another mine back here called the Ford mine which actually worked an extension of the vein system that, um, that Tiger was, was mining. So it's located back here and it produced some pretty decent wolfenites, such as this one. This was actually found in 2003. You can still go there, but the, the mine is pretty much caved in. There's not a lot left. So you can see the similarity between this and Tiger material. Now moving south to Santa Cruz County, down near the Mexican border, is the Glove Mine. The Glove Mine um, was worked in the early to mid 19th, uh, 20th century for lead and silver. Here's a picture of the main level, but it had an abundant wolfenite. You've probably seen specimens from the glove mine uh, called, uh, known as the butterscotch wolfenite. Well, the, the butterscotch colored wolfenite from the glove mine was all collected in 1958 and they came from the great 1958 wolfenite pocket. I was lucky enough to locate these photos that were taken in situ of the pocket uh, in 1958 by a guy named Harry Olson who uh, helped collect the material along with Al Haig and Dick Badeau. Um, these are really great photos. And uh, let's take a look at some of these pictures. This pocket was several feet across. You could almost crawl into it, they said. And the stuff was very easy to collect. The wolfenite crystals were kind of on a spongy, Gossin material and you could just pry them right out. So all of these crystals eventually went, you know, to the mineral collector market. So a lot of the specimens that you see in people's collections are probably pictured here somewhere. Um, there's a close up of the wolfenite crystals in situ from the famous 1958 pocket. I would say that a crystal for instance, this crystal is probably two inches on edge right here, just to give a sort of some sort of scale. There's another close up of the wolfenite crystals from that pocket and another one. So what do these specimens look like? Well, here's one. Uh, this is from the 1958 pocket now in my collection and well actually it's not in my collection it's now in the collection of dave bristol down in texas anyway um this is a nice example of material from that pocket here's another one many hundreds of pieces were were collected from this giant pocket 
there's another one. This is in the Royal Ontario Museum collection. And that's 20 centimeters across. And here's another one in the Dave Iker collection. Now the glove mine has produced a lot of different wolfenite habits, different colors, different shapes, uh, you know, different sizes. So here's a nice yellow colored piece uh, with some iron or manganese oxide coloration. This one's eight centimeters across. This is probably from the 1970s. Here's a similar one, probably from the same pocket. All right, Purple Passion Mine is uh, actually more well known for fluorescent minerals. Um, this is in north central Arizona, but it also produced some neat wolfenites. Uh, here's some wolfenite on purple fluoride. Now the final county we're going to go through is Yuma County in the extreme southwestern part of the state. This is Yuma, Arizona in the southwest corner of the state. So the first mine we'll talk about is the Puzzler Mine which has produced vanadinite specimens, but also wolfenite. So the Puzzler, of course, is another one of these old abandoned mines that collectors have gone into uh, in you know, later years and collected some nice material. So uh, in this case, wolfenite with mimetite. Here's another Puzzler mine piece, nice yellow wolfenite. And another one from the Puzzler Mine. And not far from the Puzzler Mine, which is right over here. Yeah, and I apologize, I don't have site photos for some of these. Um, but uh, near the Puzzler Mine is the Hull Mine, also known as the Rialto Mine. And it produced similar material, this, this nice kind of bright yellow material lustrous crystals. This one's 3.3 centimeters across. Often associated with uh, bipyramidal twinned cerusite crystals from the hull mine. This is a really neat combo. And occasionally you'll get these with green fluoride from this location. And here's one right here. So this is a fluorite cube with calcite and a yellow wolfenite blade. Uh, really neat combo from the Hull mine. And this was collected in the late 1960s. Um, it's now in, in my collection. And I think we're just about getting to the end of the talk. So hopefully I haven't bored you too much. It's been about an hour. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, we've got a couple more. <laughs> A couple more specimens from the Hull mine. This is really interesting because the wolfenite crystals here are growing on this, this blob of material. And what this blob is, is, is it's an extremely etched nodule of galena. So this galena has, has, uh, has basically dissolved, etched away, and in so doing, provided the lead for this wolfenite and also for a coating of uh, cerusite on the galena. So uh, really nice picture of uh, you know paragenesis happening right there in front of your eyes. Another specimen showing the same mineral paragenesis galena with uh, a coating of cerusite and Wolfenite crystals, and then over here, there's a little fluorite cube. All right, so I guess we're done. And uh, of course, we've got to end with the obligatory sunset shot. But in this case, the sunset happens to be the same color as some of the best wolfenites from the state of Arizona, our official state mineral. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I really appreciate you. you uh, being with me tonight and uh, 
Thanks so very much. All right.